started, let me open with a word of prayer. Father God, we're truly grateful for your grace in allowing us to gather to study your word, to learn more of you, so that we can learn to love you more and learn the ways you wish for us to serve you. We know that only in that will we find satisfaction in our life. We give ourselves into your care now, asking your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, open our minds and our hearts, teach us and lead us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome to our first class of the second term of Lakeside Institute of Theology. I need to do a, a couple of general business kinds of things here to start. Um, first, if you are not, if you haven't been in one of our classes before, if you're new to the Lakeside Institute of Theology, let me tell you the degree of what we are. Uh, we receive permission and uh, licensing approval from the government of Mexico a year ago, almost a year ago, to have um, an institute home, which means that we are permitted by the government of Mexico to offer certificates and degrees. Um, we began our courses last term. We had three classes uh, in October, November, or I'm sorry, September, October. Those were Old Testament survey, Old Testament theology, and how to study the Bible. If you are interested in those, the, the videos of those courses and all the materials from it are available online. So you can check all of that out. It's at litchapala.org. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go along. These courses are intended for two reasons. Primarily, we expect that people will take them for personal growth, that you can grow in your own knowledge of, of Scripture and of the history of the church and of the things of God for your own personal edification and uh, spiritual benefit. But we know that there are some people who do feel called to ministry, who feel that they want the theological training that will allow them to either go into full-time ministry or at least be uh, better equipped to do ministry activities in a part-time basis in a church or whatever. So whichever of those categories you fit in, these classes are intended for you. All right? Um, so we've got more, more pages back there. Let me tell you for just a moment uh, who I am, in case you don't know me. Most of you, I think, do, but there may be some folks here. Uh, I have a Master of Divinity in terms of credentials. Master of Divinity, which is the standard degree for ordination to uh, ministry. It's a three-year degree from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I also have all the dissertation for a THM, or Master of Theology, from Regent College in Vancouver, BC. Um, I've spent 18 years teaching this stuff through University Presbyterian Church in Seattle. Uh, most of this stuff, some of this is a little bit um, at a different level than what I usually taught through the church. But uh, we had a class there called Sunday School for Adults for 18 years, and we typically would get 80 to 100 people at 8.30 on Sunday mornings. So when you people say you can't get up early to go to church, yes you can. Okay. Um, and as most of you know, I am now senior pastor and uh, teacher here at uh, Lakeside Presbyterian Church. What is that laser beam thing that's in my eyes there, Michael? <laughs> um, I thought he was trying to get my attention. I will also say, just so you have some, some sense of my foundation, that I consider myself unapologetically evangelical. Now, I could go into a lot of details historically and theologically about what it means to be an evangelical, but, but the basic point is, I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. I believe Jesus Christ was the divine Son of God who came to earth to uh, redeem us from our sins. He died, was physically resurrected, ascended into heaven, and is coming again to be the reigning Lord. And that our primary responsibility in life is to regain our lost relationship with God the Father because of and by the work that Jesus had done on our behalf in forgiving our sins. To me, that's what an evangelical is, and that's where I'm coming from. Okay? If anybody has any questions about that, be happy to talk to you about it sometime. <laughs> there are a couple of uh, things on this sheet that I handed you. Everybody got one of these papers, right? The sign that says Lakeside Institute of Theology second term schedule and descriptions. There's two things on here. One, it will give you the basic outline of the three courses. I've tried to, to say trees here. All three of the courses that we're teaching now, New Testament survey, which is what you're in. I guess I could do the thing like, if you did not expect to arrive at New Testament survey today, then you need to be playing immediately, because <laughs> this is the New Testament survey class. Uh, we'll meet from 1 to 3 on Mondays for the next eight weeks with one week break. I have consulting with a Christian client in the States. I have to do uh, Monday through Wednesday of one week, so we will continue until March 4th. The Wednesday, as you'll see the description for our New Testament theology class, Wednesday 1 to 3, and then on Friday, spiritual disciplines of the Christian faith from 1 to 3. And this will give you a description. Now on the right-hand side of that same uh, side of the sheet, 
are the four certificates or degrees we offer. We offer a certificate of biblical studies, a certificate of biblical maturity, and it gives you uh, a, a directions there as to how many courses are required for that. A master of theology, and then our, our large, our highest level degree is a master of theology and ministry, which is our equivalent of a master of divinity in the U.S. Okay, and below that are the five uh, groupings of courses that we offer or will be offering. If you want to do the whole nine yards, the whole Megilla, uh, you know, to use an Old Testament expression. Then, if you want to get the Master of Theology and Ministry, that is a two-year program. So, if you take all the courses, then it's two years. Um, if you miss a course, but you want to be involved in a certificate or a degree, then talk with me. Uh, it's all available online, and that's why we're putting it online, so you don't have to wait two years before the courses come back around again. But uh, I want to work with you if you're doing that, so that we make sure that you're getting all the content you need. All right. On the other side of that sheet, is the reading schedule for all three courses that we are having now. The top section is this course, New Testament Survey, and uh, there are eight weeks, and so there's eight sections there. This book gives you an outline of the course, what we're going to be dealing with each week, and then over on the right-hand side, there's three columns that tell you the readings that I would like for you to do. The first one is the Bible readings. Through this eight weeks, I would like for you to read the whole New Testament if you can. I'm going to talk about if you can in just a second. Let me get back to that. The second <laughs> column is a book that most of you, I think, have gotten already. It is Nelson's book of Bible maps and charts. Actually, the complete book of Bible maps and charts. This book not only has maps of all kinds and charts of all kinds, it also has a very good, concise introduction to every book of the Bible, Old and New Testament. It tells you who the author is, who the date is, the best that a scholarship knows, or some, some of them are a little bit mysterious. It gives you a description of the purpose and topic, the recipients, and also an outline of every book in the Bible. It's a very cool book. Now, when you read on this outline, for instance, uh, for today, I had suggested, and if you didn't do it in advance, that's okay. Some people wanted to know if they could get started early. Page 277 to 280. Well, 277 to 280 is almost entirely charts or maps, so I want you to look at them, but that's not a whole lot of time involved in that. The Nelson book, big type, more charts and maps than words, but it's very valuable. That's the second column of readings. The third column of readings that I'm asking you to do is from this book, Encountering the New Testament. Uh, it's by Walter Ewell and Robert Yarbrough, and I'm very impressed with this book. Those of you who were here last term know that I kept writing because I wasn't happy with the books that we ended up with. I bought what I thought were good books, but didn't know until we actually got the order in that I wasn't real keen. Uh, this also has lots of visuals in it, for those of you who might be a little bit more image-oriented than word-oriented. No, it's got lots of words, too. Maps, charts, sidebars, commentary, um, and the subtitle is Historical and Theological Survey. So this is the text we're using for this class, the New Testament Survey, and also for the New Testament Theology course that we're having on Wednesday. It ain't cheap. Uh, this book costs 435 pesos, which is exactly what we paid for it. Um, we didn't, didn't even charge for the fact that we had to drive them to San Antonio to get them, so we're giving you the best deal we possibly can. If you have not gotten these books yet and want to purchase them, this one's 435 pesos, this one is 230 pesos, then uh, we do have them available. I will, I will tell you one thing, too, if, if you guys are strained and having a little difficulty. We had a little incident. Um, <laughs> We had these books on the bookshelf in my office, a bookshelf that we had bought recently. Come to find out that termites really like textbooks. So we have a number of these that have been have been gnawed on a little bit. We microwave them so we know that we got rid of all the bugs and the eggs and everything. There's nothing going to survive three minutes in a microwave. But if you want to get one of these, and, and most of the ones that were eaten, it's like they only like the end papers. They didn't eat the words. Um, I'll give you a, a good price on these if you're interested in getting one of those, all right? Um, and just fascinating stuff. I mean, they're, they're, they're actually kind of creative in terms of cutting out little notches in them. <laughs> Mexican buzz. There we are. Scripture says that we, we need to eat the Word of God. <laughs> but that's just a textbook. It's not even the Bible. And actually, they did. I, I know that 
I know that they were Catholic bugs because uh, <laughs> I had a Jerusalem Bible they also got into, which is a Catholic bug. Uh, yeah, and the CD-ROM, I will mention, thanks for reminding me, in the back of, of these books is a CD-ROM, and everything that is in the book is on that CD-ROM, plus there's interactive stuff on the CD-ROM that you can do self-tests, for instance, there are maps, and it, it lets you drag and drop the names, and it'll tell you if you got it right or not, so that you can learn, learn the details. So there's quite a bit of stuff in there. Now, let me talk about the amount of reading I'm asking you to do. One person has already said to me, my gosh, this is like taking a graduate level course. It is a graduate level course. That's the reason why you know, there's this kind of stuff. I can tell you, some of the, some of the courses I took in THM, we, one class I had on uh, writings in Protestant theology and philosophy, we read one book a week and then had to interact with it and, you know, in class. Some of them were 600 page theology books, okay? So no don't kidding. whine to me, you know, 100 pages. Now, I know that for some of you that's too much. That's okay. If you're doing this for personal growth, this will give you a direction. If you don't get it all read before the next class, you can catch up as you go along. Still come, if you haven't done the reading, still come to class. It's not going to hurt you uh, to not have done the reading in terms of the content from the lectures. So uh, this will give you a direction. But it is a graduate level course, but don't get scared, don't get worried, don't beat yourself up if you can't keep up, because it's fairly aggressive, the reading. Now, one thing I will tell you, those of you, and I know there are a number of you, are taking both New Testament survey and New Testament theology, because we're using the same book, I may have slightly different page breakdowns on different days, but you only have to read it once. You don't have to read it twice. <laughs> so it looks like twice as much as it really is if you're looking at those two classes. Okay? Any questions about that? Is that all pretty clear? Yep. All right. And I will we'll have a break midway through, and if you want to purchase the books then or after class, I can sell them to you. Now, there are a few... Um, Policies and requirements, very few. This is the whole of the requirements we have. And by the way, I think you know this already, you wouldn't be here. There is no charge for these classes at all. Um, you pay the cost of the books exactly what they cost us because we're doing this because we believe God wants us to have more knowledge of his word, of his will, that we grow in him because of that. And this is a ministry of our church, so we're not charging you for any of this. The classes are free, as you see from the policies and requirements. But all students seeking a certificate or degree must purchase the books, and I ask that you purchase them in paper, not electronically. Nobody, trust me, nobody loves Kindles more than my wife and I do. I, my current Kindle is called Ross's seventh Kindle. That tells you something, okay? We have pretty much all of them that have come out. But the problem with using a Kindle for this kind of thing, it's very hard for me to say, okay, turn to the chart on page 272 or read from page X to page Y in a given week because that's not how the pages are handled in electronic format. Now, there are, there are some exceptions to that. There's one person here who's very mobile and can't really keep books, and I said, I'll make an exception for you. But for the most part, if you're taking this for a certificate or degree, I would rather you have the paper books. And it's really not that much in terms of library, okay? Um, if that's a problem for you, but you still want to get a certificate or degree, come and talk to me. You know, exceptions are always available. Secondly, students in the certificate or degree tracks may miss no more than one class per course without arrangements made in advance with the teacher. What I actually do, because we now have all of the material up online, we're going to try to have each week the video lectures, that's why the camera, will be online, and what I'm going to ask is that you watch the video, review the materials, if you can't be here, and send me an email. We, we had a form that got messed up, and so just send me an email and say, I missed this class, but I have watched the videos and reviewed the materials. I trust you. We're all adults here, okay? So that's all we're going to require, but do check with me if you're going to be missing a number of different classes to make sure that you're getting everything you need. Third, students in certificate or degree tracks will be required to take a pass-fail final exam in each course based on study guidelines provided by the teacher. Okay. Everybody panicked about this last course, last term. Um, how many of you were in one of the courses last term and, and took the tests? Did you die? Okay. I, I will give you, uh, probably midterm uh, and then toward the end of the term, a document which will tell you all of the basic things that you need to know. 
And then the test will be based only upon those things. I, I want you to succeed, okay? This is not a temptation. If you get a test, the idea is for you to succeed. And so I will make sure that you get the material and that you know what it is that's expected of you. If you're taking it for a degree or a certificate, you do need to take the test. Everybody passed it. I mean, I think that probably 90% of the people had 90% or more. It's not that big a deal. Ron? Uh, we said we passed the top third, most of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Since I think there only was a top third. I mean, <laughs> um, so again, the reason for the test is because it focuses you on the things that you really need to know. But I will tell you what that is, so don't worry about it. I know some people started reading the book already, and this book offers review questions and, and study questions and all that. Those are good. They're good things, st things to study. But I will tell you which ones are actually going to be on the, on the exam that you need to be really concerned about. Um, if you are in the certificate or degree program, you do need to make a passing grade based, based, upon, based upon pass fail in each of the courses to receive credit toward a degree or certificate. And if you are wanting to get a degree that is a Master of Theology or a Master of Theology Ministry, I ask you to come and talk to me at some point in the next couple of weeks if you haven't done so already. Last term, most of the people did, but I'd just like to talk to you about that. Any questions about any of that? Okay, we're getting through all of the, the boring stuff first. Um, let me see, what haven't I talked about? You wouldn't know, would you? Um, okay, I want to start today with um, a quote. It's a quote my wife just sent me, and it's from Charles Spurgeon. This actually is a sermon from a sermon, apparently, that he preached on the 7th of January, this date, in 1855. Is it Cameron? Yes, it is. Um, and so this is Charles Spurgeon, a great, great English preacher, who I love. I quote Spurgeon fairly often. He, he, had, he not only was a great preacher, he was also very funny. Uh, but Spurgeon said this, The proper study of God's elect is God. Uh, the proper study of a Christian is the Godhead, the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the works, the doings and the existence of the great God whom he calls Father. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in the contemplation of divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. No subject of contemplation will tend more to humble the mind than thoughts of God. But while the subject humbles the mind, it also expands it. He who often thinks of God will have a larger mind than the man who simply plods around this narrow globe. <laughs> That's a really good definition for why we do this and why you all are here today. Okay? And his name is what? Charles Spurgeon. S P U R G E L N. And you could go online and find, in fact, Carol gave this to me because uh, she, she. What? Oh. She has a, uh, she gets a meditation from Spurgeon every day as part of her devotional. Okay, uh, let's talk about this particular class, New Testament Survey. I'm going to move forward just a touch so that I can see that too. This is the outline for our course. Uh, this is on the reading schedule, but I just wanted to go through it quickly. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what is a survey course, give you some basic introduction. Most of our time today is going to be spent on uh, cultural and historic context for the study of the New Testament. I'm going to give you, does anybody like history? <laughs> You're going to get a belly full of it today. Trust me. So we're going to deal with a lot of history. Um, but the, the basic class will start today with an introduction to New Testament theology, including the historical and cultural context in which the New Testament was written. Um, and then we are going next week to look at the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You may not be aware that the Gospels are of two kinds. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic, which means same seeing. They are all three pretty straightforward historical considerations of the life of Jesus. John, on the other hand, is much more theological. John is less concerned with the... Uh, historical content and more concerned with what it means, the theology of it. So next week we're going to look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic, the same seeing Gospels. On the third week we're going to look at the Gospel of John and the book of Acts, simply because we've only got eight weeks. 
Okay, we need to put a couple things together. On the fourth week, we are going to consider Paul, the person of Paul and theology of Paul. We'll also look at the first half, roughly, of the Pauline epistles. An epistle is a letter. And so these are the Pauline letters. We will, go, we will look at Romans to Galatians, those letters, in the fourth week. And in the fifth week, we will continue the consideration of the Pauline letters or epistles, looking at Ephesians to Philemon, because Paul wrote 13 letters or epistles. The sixth week, we will look at what's called the general epistles. These are the letters of the New Testament that were not written by Paul. They were written by several people. They start with Hebrews and go through Jude. And then the seventh week, we are going to look at the book of Revelation, the book of the Revelation to John. And we're going to talk about expectations for the fulfillment of the things promised in the New Testament. Last week, we were going to do a conclusion and wrapping up. And the final exam, which will be the second hour. Okay. Now, I reserve the right to change this as needed as we go along, depending upon questions and materials and whatnot as I develop this stuff. But this will be our general course approach. Okay, any questions about that? And you have that outline on your reading sheet. It's the thing that your reading guide is, is key to. All right, let's talk about what is a New Testament survey. This is called the New Testament survey class. Uh, a New Testament survey, by definition, is only an introduction and overview we are not going to, for instance, dig into the serious theological content of the book of Romans in this class. There will be other courses where we get into more detail. But our purpose here is to develop a clear view of both context and content for the New Testament, of the New Testament. But admittedly, we are going to be doing this at a 30,000 foot level. In, in our How to Study the Bible course last term, we talked about, uh, a lot of people have observed, that the first step toward really having an understanding of the Bible is you have to have a general understanding of what's in it. You have to understand what the content is generally before you can dig in and really get the meat where you suck the marrow from the bone of the Word of God. And so this is the class where you begin to get a good, strong overview. Now, even if you feel like you've got a general understanding of the New Testament, I still think you're going to benefit from this because I'm going to try to make some associations that, that you may not have had before. So, to cover all of the New Testament in eight weeks, it will be necessary that we don't go into great detail. Um, and the deep theological issues we are not going to deal with in this class. We will deal with some highlights of those. If you want deeper theological stuff from the New Testament, then show up on Wednesday at 1 o'clock. <laughs> because that's our New Testament theology class, in which we are not going to deal with as much of the, the, the overview. We're going to dig into the... That class will be focused on the Christological theology, the theology of Jesus as the Christ, the Anointed One, the Savior. We're going to deal with the theology of the Trinity. We're going to deal with the, the Soteriology, which is the theology of salvation. Um, even Hamartiology, which is the theology of sin. You're going to learn all kinds of new words. Okay, if you don't know what <laughs> but this class, we are going to deal with the high-level kind of overview of everything. But you'll end up, in fact, uh, my next slide, what can and should you expect from this New Testament survey? By the end of this class, assuming you show up for the lectures and you read the materials, you should have a good sense of the historical and cultural uh, context in which the New Testament was written. And you should have a comprehensive understanding of what is contained. Now, I say comprehensive, meaning the whole breadth of it, not huge depth, but you'll have a comprehensive breadth of understanding of what is contained in the writings of the New Testament and why we believe it is God's word to us. All right? That's what this class is about. That's what you should expect. Any questions about that? Either I'm really good or you all are really tired. I don't know. Uh, okay, let's keep going. I want, I've used this slide before. What do we believe about the word of God? Since this is a New Testament survey, we're talking about um, the, the Word of God. We believe that the Bible is four things. I could, I could give you a lot of other things, but four things in particular. We believe that the Bible is God's Word revealed. God has not hidden Himself from us. He has revealed Himself to us, especially through His Word. He's also revealed Himself through the incarnate Christ and in other ways, but especially through the Word of God. Jeremiah 30 says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write in a book all the words I have spoken to you. We believe that this is God's revelation of himself. It's what the Bible is about. Secondly, we believe the Bible is inspired. From 2 Timothy 3, 
All scripture is God-breathed, and God-breathed there, the word in Greek is pneuma, which means breath or, or wind. That's the same word for the Holy Spirit, the pneuma, the breath of God. So that very expression, that it is God-breathed, has inherent in it the idea that the Holy Spirit's involved. Okay? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Third, we believe that the Word of God is authoritative. It has authority for our lives. From 1 Corinthians 15, For what I received, Paul writes, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, how? According to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. The Word of God in Scripture has authority for our lives. It is the thing on which we base our beliefs. And finally, we believe of the four that God's Word is living. For the Word of God, Hebrews 4 says, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So we believe God's Word, and we're studying the New Testament, the new expression, the newer expression of God's Word, as being revealed, inspired, authoritative, and living. Somebody once said, well, yeah, but you're leaving out Jesus. You know, our faith is really in Jesus. Absolutely. We are saved by Jesus. Our faith is in Him as the Son of God. But where do we find God's witness to us of Jesus? In His Word. It is the basis for our beliefs because it is that that we receive the message of the saving uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit that convicts us of the truth of those things. All right? Questions about that? Those of you who know, feel, you'll understand. Feel free to stop me at any time, raise your hand, call out if I'm not paying attention, throw your shoe at me, whatever you have to do to get my attention. If you've got a question, I want to make sure we deal with it. So please feel free to ask questions. Okay? Are we all right? Now, what is the New Testament? This is a survey of the New Testament. Keep saying it's the Word of God. My definition, and this is the definition according to Ross, is the New Testament is the story of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus Christ, which is found in the four Gospels, of the birth and growth of the early church, which is the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and the development and articulation of the Christian faith and theology, which are the epistles, and the revelation as well, but the epistles primarily. That is a matter-of-fact definition of what the New Testament is. Now, we believe on top of that that it, it is the Word of God. Okay, no question about that. But we believe that it is the record of the earthly ministry and life of Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, of the birth and growth of the uh, early Christian church, and of the development and articulation of Christian theology. All right? Make sense? We also believe, or we know, that the uh, New Testament consists of 27 books that were written in Koine, or Common Greek. Koine means common. Between the years of AD 40 and 100, now liberal scholars will tell you 150, 180, 220. Most scholars, even those who are not particularly evangelical, have now come back around to saying, no, the books were written much earlier than the liberal scholars. And I'll start picking on the Germans already, Bob, since you, you, know, you complained about my, my talking about German theologians. The fact is, most of the liberal and, and unfortunately damaging theology of the 18th and 19th century started in Germany. You know, um, They were too smart and didn't have enough to do. And so they came out with theologies that were quite destructive. And some of them had to do with different doctrines or theories about Scripture that tended to make it much later, and what that meant was, well, the people who wrote it didn't know Jesus, they didn't know the people who knew Jesus, they didn't really know what they are talking about, the miracles aren't real, you can't trust any of this stuff. Most scholars today are now agreeing, scholars worth anything, whether they're evangelical or not, that most of the books of the Bible were written uh, by 100 AD, so that they were all within a generation or a generation and a half of the time of Jesus himself. And one of the last writers of the New Testament was John, the Apostle John, who had been a very young man, probably only 16 or so, when he knew Jesus, and he lived to longer than any of the other apostles. He was one of the few who died a natural death um, at, of old age, and so he continued to write. We have 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in the book of Revelation were written quite late, uh, but it was written during that time period by nine different authors. 
We have Matthew, and again, we believe, we take a fairly traditional uh, view, do, uh, view of this, I do. Matthew the Apostle wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Mark, who was early on a traveling uh, companion of Paul, but later was assistant and secretary to Peter, wrote the second Gospel. And so the, book, the Gospel of Mark is pretty much the Gospel according to St. Peter, we believe. Uh, Luke wrote two books. He's the only Gentile writer of any part of the Bible. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. So he wrote the life of Jesus and the life of the early church. Uh, the, the Apostle John, the beloved Apostle, wrote five books. The Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, um, and Revelation. So those five. We then have Paul wrote 13 letters. Uh, Peter wrote two, first and second Peter, although as we say, the book of the Gospel of Mark is kind of the Gospel according to Peter. Mark wrote it down for him. And Jude, very short letter, and then the anonymous writer of the book of Hebrews. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. I personally think it was Priscilla, a woman. We'll talk about that later, okay, when we get to Hebrews. Uh, not the only one who holds that view, but I think that there's a reason why we don't know who the writer of Hebrews was. A long time ago, they used to say it was Paul. It wasn't Paul. The, the theology is valid, but it's a very different approach than Paul took. The language is different from Paul's. You know, Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, and Hebrews, by the very name, was entirely oriented toward the Jewish Christians. So um, we do not know who the author of Hebrews was. So those 27 books. Let me talk about those broken down into five sections. The first section, of course, are the Gospels. And I mentioned already the Synoptic Gospels. There are three of those, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the same seeing, historically oriented Gospels. Then there is the Theological Gospel of John. And by the way, all of these PowerPoints, if you're new to the classes, they're all going to be online for you. So you, you take your notes you know, uh, from what I have to say, but you don't have to copy all of this stuff. If You, you can uh, go online, download it as a PowerPoint. <coughs> Or a PDF, uh, we'll get that stuff up sometime this week, right, Carolyn? Right. All right. <laughs> Carolyn is our, our uh, webmaster of all mm. this stuff. She created the website for us. So. Uh, we then have the second section are the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts is unique in that it is the history of the, the birth and growth of the church. We then have, as I said, the Pauline epistles. There are 13 of those. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Then the general epistles, eight of them, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. And then finally, the fifth category, the single book of Revelation, which is a prophetic, apocalyptic book. Apocalypse and apocalyptic doesn't mean everything blows up. It literally means a, re a revealing. You know, an apocalypsis is a revealing of something. So when we talk about the Apocalypse of John, that's exactly the same thing as the Revelation of John. Okay? Um, it's important for you, if you, don't know, uh, if you haven't experienced this or don't know it, to realize that the books are not in chronological order. Um, you, if you want to get a book in chronological order, there are Bibles out there that take the books of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, and put them in chronological order. Strangely enough, at some point in the past, somebody decided to take all of the letters of Paul, for instance, and put them in order of length. The longest one is Romans, the shortest one is Philemon. Roughly, there's a little bit of difference in there in the middle. But uh, almost certainly the first book of the New Testament was either James, the book of James, or it was the book of Galatians, which comes right in the middle of Paul's letters. Uh, so if you want to know the chronological order, and when you, if you get, get into studying theology, that's actually quite helpful. Because by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul's theology developed, it sort of smoothed out. It didn't change, but he began to give more subtle explanations and understanding of it as he proceeds. So you read Galatians, and there's a simplicity to it. You get to Romans, and it is the theological tome of the New Testament. And it's actually kind of helpful to know the chronological order. We'll get into that as we go along a little bit. Uh, but that's, that might be helpful to you. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Okay. Let's talk about the historical setting and context. I believe that to fully understand the New Testament as much as we can, we need to know as much as we reasonably can know. Now, you could, you could work 10 hours a day for the rest of your life and not know all of the historical and cultural context of the New Testament. But I think we need to know as much as we can about 
what the history and culture was, the environment in which these events of the New Testament occurred, and in which they were recorded. There are a lot of, a lot of facts that if you don't know them, things don't, well, you don't know nearly as much in the New Testament as you think you do. For instance, why did Jesus speak Aramaic? Because that was a common language. That's probably when he said Talitha Gomi, you know, to the little girl. He was speaking Aramaic. The common language was Aramaic. It wasn't Hebrew, and it wasn't Greek. They did speak Greek commonly, because that was the global language. Do you know what Aramaic was? Go find out a little bit later. Uh, stay tuned. Why is the New Testament written in Greek and not in Hebrew? Since all of them were Jews, except for Luke, who wrote in Acts, why did they write it in Greek, not in Hebrew? Um, who were the Pharisees, and who were the Sadducees, and why didn't they seem to like each other? Do you have any sense of that? If you understand that, then a lot of the things that get said to Jesus and by Jesus make a lot more sense. There's a wonderful scene, for instance, when Paul in Acts is arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin, and in the Sanhedrin, the royal, the, the high council of the Jewish people, some of them were Pharisees, some of them were Sadducees. Well, Paul says, the reason I'm here today, the reason I was arrested, is because I believe in and preach the resurrection. And the place explodes! They start arguing at each other and throwing stools and all kinds of stuff. Well, unless you understand something about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and differences that they had, you're not going to understand. Well, in fact, it was so, such a kerfuffle when Paul said that, that the Roman guards who were there had to remove it because they were afraid that this was going to turn into a riot. Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees very much believed in the resurrection, and we're going to talk about why that is. So when Paul, being very clever, says, I'm here because I believe in the resurrection, the Pharisees are saying, yes, we like him, him we like. And the Sadducees are going, no, 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 give him. And so they start fighting, and Paul leaves with the Romans. Okay? <laughs> You've got to know something about the history that led to that in order for that to make sense to you. Uh, why was it a Sadducee who asked Jesus the, to explain how if a man is supposed to marry his brother's widow, a woman has a, is married, her husband dies, she marries his brother, he dies, maybe he's got seven husbands. Who's going to be married to her in heaven? The reason a Sadducee asked that is they don't believe in the resurrection. And so you understand something about the trickery they were trying to use. Um, why and how were Gen Jewish synagogues created? Do you know? For a long time, it was just the temple, and then synagogues came along, local, rural kind of worshiping places. We'll talk about that. Why was there such animosity between Jesus, or between Jews, excuse me, and the Samaritans? The, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the, the story of Jesus with the woman at the well in Samaria, those will not make really sense to you. You don't fully understand what they mean, unless you know something about the history of the Samaritans, who were the Samaritans, and the history of the Jews and why they didn't get along. Okay? We're going to get into a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, but that gives you, I believe, just a few examples of how the context, the cultural and historic context, will give you a better, richer, more complete understanding of the things that you read in the New Testament. Fair? Questions? All right. I want to start now with uh, some highlights of Jewish history. I'm going to give you just a few dates to kind of place you in the timeline of the Jewish people. Um, and at some point along here, in another 20 minutes or so, we'll take a break for a few minutes, but I want to get started on the, the history. And as I say, I want to give you a belly full of history here. You're going to learn stuff you never thought about. Um, first, to give you a point in time so that you've got a perspective, Abram, the start of the Jewish people, was when God called Abram, he was then called Abram, exalted father, to get up, take, him, take his family, and follow where God would take him, where God wanted him to go. And so later on, God changed his name to Abraham, and he changed his wife Sarai's name to Sarah. Abraham was father of many, because he and Sarah were old and didn't have kids, but God promised, if you will follow me and be my guy, I will be your God, you will be my people, and you will be the father of a great nation. So that was 2,000 years before the time of Jesus, roughly, about 2090. And by the way, if you ever see a little C in front of the dates, you know what that means? Circa. It means, as best we know, about. So we think this was about 2090 or so. It was about second millennium before the time of Christ, B.C. Then, 
Um, jumping ahead, I'm just giving a few dates so that you kind of get signposts along the way. Sometime around 1445, circa 1445 to 1405 BC, this is all before Christ, uh, we have the exodus from Egypt where God, God called Moses back from his self, uh, his self generated exile to come and take the Jewish people out of slavery in Egypt. You have the giving of the law at Mount Sinai through Moses. So the creation. Abraham was the father of the, of the people of Israel. Moses was the founder of the nation of Israel, if you will, and the religion of Israel through, by God's act. God did it, but he did it through Moses. The Jewish religion didn't exist as a real religion until the law was given to Moses. So Abraham was the father of the nation. Moses was the father of the religion of the nation because God knew what he was doing in terms of timing. All right? So the law was given. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. They say it's because it was a man leading them and he wouldn't stop and ask for directions. But <laughs> there are other reasons. But 40 years in the desert and then the entry into the promised land. That was about 1,400 years before the time of Christ. About 600 years after Abraham. Six or seven hundred years. Then we come to the time of the United Monarchy, which is about 1050 BC. Or just to sort of keep it in your mind, I, I usually think, okay, Abraham was 2,000 years before Jesus. Um, Moses was about 1,500 years before Jesus. David, Saul and David and Solomon were about 1,000 years before Jesus. So that you got chunks, okay, so that you can identify times. Sometime around 1,000 or 1050, we have the United Monarchy, where God has, even though he didn't want to, the Israelites demanded a king, and God had Samuel the prophet anoint Saul to be the first king of Israel. After Saul failed God, King David is brought forth, becomes the great king, one of the most important figures in the, in the Old Testament, and then after David, his son Solomon. So there were only three kings of the united monarchy. And it was especially David and Solomon that made Israel great. That was the only time period in the whole of the Israeli, Israelite history, the whole history of the Jewish people, where they truly were a, a nation of some significance. People from all over, like the Queen of Sheba from North Africa, came to visit in Solomon's day because Israel was great and rich and known. They went downhill pretty quick after that. Right? Then, about 931, the kingdom becomes divided because of the disobedience of Solomon and his willingness to allow, because of his wives, women got in trouble, uh, he allowed the Israelites and even encouraged them to worship other gods. And so the kingdom is split in two. In the north, the kingdom, confusingly enough, continues to be called the kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. In the north, there were pretty much ten of the tribes. In the south, there was Judah, the biggest of all the tribes, and Benjamin. So, ten tribes in the north, two in the south, but they're two completely different kingdoms. At various times, they fought each other. Sometimes, they would get together and, and combine and get to fight somebody else. But they were two very distinct kingdoms. Then, the northern kingdom, I should say, had horrible kings and queens. Ahab and Jezebel. You've heard somebody go, oh, she's a real Jezebel. Where do you think that comes from? One of the worst of all the queens, yes. Uh, you know the actual meaning of the word... Like what that name means? Jezebel? No. What does it mean? No, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I thought we were going to learn something else here. Um, but, so Jezebel and Ahab were examples of just horrible people worshipping other gods. And when we say worshipping other gods, this was not friendly worship. Most of the gods, like Molech and others that they worshipped in the north, um, involved child sacrifice. People were expected to sacrifice their first child alive in, a, in an open fire to these gods. You wonder why the, the one God of Israel was so offended by the worship of these other gods? Part of it was because it was so horrible what these people did. You go back and watch the videos for the Old Testament uh, survey. And you, mm -hmm. We talked more about the, the gods of the ancient Hebrews uh, that they worshipped and that the other uh, people in Palestine worshipped. I should say something else. As we get into this, I will usually refer to the land that, of Israel as Palestine. The reason I do that, Palestine actually comes from, uh, from another word, but it's confusing because if you call it Israel, well, do you mean the northern kingdom of Israel? Do you mean the modern nation of Israel? Do you mean, you know, 
Palestine has been the most universally used term for that area of the world. So when I'm talking about that sort of geopolitical entity generally, I'll usually call it Palestine. They didn't actually call it Palestine for all that time of history, but it just simplifies things, okay? So, Palestine is broken up into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom <coughs> called Judah. The northern kingdom was, they didn't have one good king. Their kings were all horrible. In the south, they had a number of kings that were actually quite good, Josiah and Hezekiah and a number of others, that really tried to bring people back to God and to bring right worship and all of that. Well, the northern kingdom was so bad that God, in 722 B.C., brings the Assyrian army, one of the great empires of the world, brings them over and has them destroy the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, which was based, their capital was in Samaria, the town of Samaria, which is where you get Samaritan. It's where you get, the, you know, the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus was in the town of Samaria when he did that. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, when, As when Assyria destroys the northern kingdom of Israel, one of the things that they used to do when they conquered somebody, and Assyria was a huge and powerful empire. In fact, they had more than one ascendancy when they were powerful. This is the Neo-Assyrian Empire. They had actually been great, declined to come back. They used to take the people they conquered and carry them off into slavery and force them to intermarry with other peoples and even bring other people into there and encourage them to intermarry. The idea being, if we can water down their bloodline and split them all up, there's less likelihood that they're going to have any sense of national identity and want to fight back. The Assyrians were very good at that. In fact, the ten tribes of the north became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. You've heard of the lost tribes of Israel? Now, they weren't completely lost because through this whole process, uh, groups of them kind of ran off down to the south. So some of those tribes remained. But in terms of any kind of uh, identifiable entities, we were left with the two tribes of the south, Judah and, Eph uh, and uh, Benjamin. Sometimes, by the way, you'll read in, in the scripture, and Isaiah, and other places, they'll talk about, oh, Ephraim, my son. You recognize that? The southern kingdom was often referred to generally as Judah, even before it's called the southern kingdom of Judah, because Judah was the largest tribe. Well, the largest tribe in the north was the tribe of Ephraim. Okay? And so Ephraim is a generic word for the nation of the northern kingdom of Israel and the people who were there. So... The northern kingdom is destroyed by Assyria in 722 and thoroughly and completely destroyed. Okay, then more highlights. I'm gonna, I want to talk now about the different kingdoms and different periods that we um, that occurred in this region that affected the Israelites, that affected Palestine and the Jewish people. Now there were other kingdoms that I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to get into the Hittites or the you know the Phoenician people, there, there, there are lots of others. I'm going to talk about just the ones that specifically affected this time period. The reason I'm doing this, the events that occurred from really the fall of the northern kingdom to Assyria in 722 BC, and even more when the southern kingdom falls to Babylon, we'll get to it in a few minutes, so seriously affected the psyche and the spirit and even the conduct of the Jewish people that you need to know about how they were affected by those things in order to, as I said, fully understand what's going on in some of the things that happen in the New Testament. Because the, the Hebrew people, Jesus was a Jew. All of his followers were Jewish initially. Paul was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. The Jewish people, everything that affected the Jewish people also affected the environment that all of this stuff happened in. And so that's why it's valuable for us to know that. I've got 10 minutes still, too. Because I'm getting into this empire period, Assyrian and Babylonian and whatnot, the, the Hellenistic, I think this is a good time to take a break. Um, let's take a 10-minute break. I've got a number of my consult if you're interested. Let's get started back. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the effect of that. I've already started on that a little bit because I mentioned to you, you know, the first part of it is that in 722 B.C., uh, the Assyrians uh, attack Samaria, destroy it, destroy the northern kingdom of Israel completely and totally. Well, in a flush of success, uh, Sennacherib, who was the then emperor of the Assyrian Empire, the Assyrians had the coolest names. Mm -hmm. Tiglath Pileser III. <laughs> okay. uh, great, it's wonderful stuff. But Sennacherib was the emperor of the Assyrians at that time. When he 
conquered and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, he just drove south and got to Jerusalem in the intent of destroying the southern kingdom of Judah. He starts a siege, camps out outside. The prophet Isaiah tells then King Hezekiah of Judah, Hezekiah was one of their good kings, tells Hezekiah, do not give in. God does not want you to surrender to this Assyrian uh, uh, emperor. So Hezekiah says, yeah, you know, forget you. And against this hugely powerful army, this is recorded in 2 Kings 18 and in 2 Chronicles 32. It's referred to in two places in Isaiah as well. And the, the King James is kind of cool. It says, and the Assyrian army the next morning awoke to find themselves dead. <laughs> about that. What happened, apparently, is that God sent a, a, a plague that killed a huge number of this large Assyrian army, and sufficiently so that Sennacherib packed up his bags and went back to Nineveh, which was the, the, uh, the home of the Assyrian kingdom. Jonah, by the way, the prophet Jonah, on his way to Nineveh, was going to minister, to preach to, to evangelize the Assyrians. All of these kingdoms, by the way, Assyria, um, in Nineveh, you've got uh, the Babylonian Empire with Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar comes to believe in the one true God. So a lot of these stories tell us that God was not just the God of the Jews. They were his specially selected people. But he demonstrates over and over again that he was the God of the whole earth, including with Jonah, uh, the Ninevites, who were the Assyrians. Well, so Sennacherib goes back home, and a short time after he turns home, two of his sons kill him. Um, that happened a lot back then. And so Sennacherib is killed, a new emperor comes up. But the, they were in the shadow days, basically, of the Assyrian Empire. Now, this Neo-Assyrian Empire had lasted over 300 years. You'll notice, from 934 to 609. But uh, within about 100 years of their failing to defeat the southern kingdom of Judah, Babylon, the kingdom of the Babylonians, comes up and starts to grow in power. And eventually in 612 BC, a combined army of the Babylonians, the Medes, who were, you've heard the Medes and the Persians related to the Persian armies from that part of the world, and the Scythians, they all got together, defeated Assyria, and then totally destroyed them in about 609 BC. At that point, there was a contest, the primary contest with the Assyrians out of the way, were between the Babylonians, which were from modern-day Iraq, all right? The Assyrians were from roughly modern-day Iran, well, Persia is Iran, but from a little further east. The Babylonians were from modern, what we call Iraq, Babylon, the city in Iraq, and so these are all from the area of Mesopotamia, which means the land between the rivers. It's where, um, where Abram had originally come from. So Babylon in the Mesopotamian area and Egypt down south, of course, are now vying to be the most powerful um, empire, the most powerful political force in the eastern Mediterranean area. And Palestine is where? Right in the middle. So whenever these two great empires, when their armies wanted to fight each other, there was only one way they could get at each other, and that was go through Palestine, or what used to be called the Levant. Okay? Um, so, because of this competition in Israel, they sort of felt like they needed to pick sides. Well, they couldn't decide. There were certain forces in Jerusalem, in, in the Jewish people, who were supporting Babylon, certain ones supporting Egypt. In 599, keep going here, um, the, after the Babylonians have defeated the Assyrians, and they're in power, in 599, the Babylonians come in and conquer Judah and the city of Jerusalem. Initially, they just defeat them. They don't destroy them. And the reason they do it is because in Jerusalem, the various leaders, some of them sided with Babylon, thinking they'll win. Some of them sided with Egypt. Finally, the pro-Egypt side had gained power in Jerusalem, and Babylon said, we need to do something about this. So in 599, they come in and they step on them and say, we're now in charge here. And they become what in those days would have been called a client state, which means they're letting you run your own affairs, but you know who's really in charge. And they would have to pay duty and things like that to them. Well, that was 599 uh, and 598. The, but in Israel, in Jerusalem, they continue to feel like we don't like having anybody over us. And they continue to kind of rebel. And so in 586, the Babylonian army 
under Nebuchadnezzar, comes to Jerusalem, lays siege to it, and this time, uh, and I should have said, by the way, that in 599, when they conquered them the first time, that they did carry off a lot of the Jewish people into Babylon in a deportation or exile. Among them was the prophet Ezekiel. If you read the book of the prophet Ezekiel, then he talks about, by the rivers of Babylon, we wept. Okay? Because he was one part of the first group that got taken off as exiles. Sometimes they would do that uh, to sort of have them as hostages. You know, we've got part of your people, you better not mess up. <coughs> then in 586 they came back and they completely destroyed Jerusalem. It took off the second and largest deportation of Jews back to Babylon. And when they destroyed it, they destroyed the whole city, they destroyed the temple of God, they burned it, took most of the population off, left only a few of them there. Actually, the few that they left behind still created problems, so that they came back again a few years later and had the third of the exiles in 582. This was the start of the Babylonian exile, it was called. The nation of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, who thought... God loves us, even though he didn't love the northern kingdom of, of Israel, because they were all horrible. He still loved us. We were still his people. But now the Babylonians, with their pagan gods, you know, Molech and others, have defeated us. How does that work? In fact, um, the Babylonian exile changed the Jewish people in a number of ways. First, it left them wondering, does this mean that Yahweh God is not as powerful as the Babylonian gods. Because in those days, whoever had the strongest gods would win. And so when they won, when one of the empires won, they'd say, ah, neater, 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 our God's better than your God. Okay? And so the Israelites, who always, despite all of the back and forth and powers and empires, they had always been able to maintain, in the southern kingdom at least, the Judah, their presence there. Now they had been defeated, destroyed, the temple was burned, and so they were left saying, is our God Yahweh not really the one true, all-powerful, almighty creator God? Because the uh, Babylonians with different gods beat us. So they had to deal with that. Then they were left uh, wondering if, well, maybe the problem is that God just no longer loves us. Maybe we are no longer his own chosen people, the select of God. And so they struggled with that. Then they had to ask the question, how do we go on from here? You know, how can we move forward when the things that we thought represented or were the mark of us being God's people, especially the promised land, which they were no longer in, they were carried off into captivity in Babylon, or the temple, which was supposed to be the throne of God on earth. That was where God lived. How can we still go on as God's people when the things that represented being God's people are no longer available to us? The promised land and the temple especially. And then they said, and by the way, what do we do without the temple? How do we worship? All of Jewish worship was oriented around the temple at that point. Animal sacrifice, people were required to come. They're supposed to come three times a year for three great festivals in Jerusalem. Well, they came at least once. Almost everybody you know, would come for the, the Passover. Passover didn't just start Jesus' time. It's an ancient uh, recognition of the exodus from Egypt. And how do, we, how do we worship God without a temple? And then they feared being assimilated into a foreign culture because that's what had happened to the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember the ten lost tribes. They were so completely assimilated into a foreign culture, they didn't exist as a people anymore. And the Israelites, that, that is the, the, the Jews, the Israelites from Judah, were saying, are we going to lose our whole identity as a people? Well, all of those things were ways in which the Jews were affected. And ultimately, there was, a, there was a huge amount of despair. They didn't get it. How could their God let this happen if he was all-powerful, if he was still their special God? And how could they deal with all of the things they lost in this? Now, um, the Babylonian exile also, we have to recognize, not only challenged the Jewish people, but it changed the Jewish people in a bunch of ways. I'll give you just two important ones. First, the Jews began using Aramaic, which was also called Chaldean. The, um, you remember that Abram came from Ur of the Chaldees. Remember that expression in the Old Testament? 
the Chaldees was the land of Mesopotamia. It was the same area as the Babylonians. So the ancient language of Babylon was called Chaldean. Later on, it started to be called Aramaic. Aramaic was sort of the parent language because um, the, the, the empires of Assyria and Babylon both used a Semitic language. Semitic meaning you know, descended from Noah's son Shem. But there were a number of different Semitic languages where they were similar on the same root, but not exactly the same. Like we have Romance languages. You know, you've got Italian, you've got Spanish, you've even got French, languages that are based on the same roots. Well, these were all Semitic languages, Hebrew, Chaldean, and then various other kinds of Ara uh, Aramaic languages that had been used by the Assyrians and by the Babylonians. Well, because the Jews are living in Babylon, they're in exile, and, and the people who run that country don't speak Hebrew, they speak Aramaic, the Jews started speaking Aramaic as their everyday language. If you all moved down here and you had little kids, and they grew up down here, what would they speak? They may speak, yeah, they may speak English at home, but they're going to start speaking Spanish in the streets. That's what happened. Most of the Jews, most at this point, still spoke Hebrew, but they also began to use Aramaic as the common language. That continued all the way down past the time of Jesus, which is why Jesus and others uh, in the New Testament spoke Aramaic as their common language. Bless you. We'll talk later about where the Greek thing comes from, because that's another historic event that led us to that. But Aramaic infiltrated, another Semitic language infiltrated the Jewish culture completely, and everybody spoke it. It was the street language. Secondly, the Jews came to believe that all of the horrible things that had happened in the Babylonian, Babylonian exile had happened because they had lacked faithfulness to God, which was true. Okay? When they were still faithful to God under Hezekiah, God protected them. When they after Hezekiah, when they wandered away from him, he brought judgment through the Babylonians to them too. But because they recognized that the lack of faithfulness to God was the cause of their fall, there was a renewed interest. During the Babylonian exile, while they were away from the Promised Land, there was a renewed interest in prayer, in scripture reading, and other kinds of pious studies, and in community life. The community life was so that they wouldn't fall victim to the assimilation. They'd still stay true to being Jewish instead of becoming some lost mixture like the northern kingdom had been. Well, the, all of that, the study of scripture, the other pious study, prayer, community life, they had to have location for that. So they created the synagogue system. They did not do animal sacrifice or any of the things that were part of the temple worship. But instead, it was a much less formal kind of event. They didn't have to have high priests. They would get rabbis. Rabbi means teacher. Okay, it's not the same thing as a high priest. You didn't have to be a Levite to be a rabbi or teacher. You did have to be a Levite to be a high priest. So it was like a scaled down, less formal, spread out, many different locations approach to still getting together to recognize God in their lives. That's the synagogue system. The thing is, after they get back to Israel, and even after they rebuild the temple, they continued to have synagogues out in the countryside so that people, especially poor people, didn't have to make the long and costly trip back to Jerusalem in order to worship. They had a local synagogue where they could go to pray and to study, to uh, discuss pious things, to have local schools, religious schools. Initially, all, of basic, all of the training in religious work had been done in Jerusalem at the temple. Now this was all spread out. You had yeshivas associated with synagogues, which were schools. Yes? What does synagogue mean? I don't know. Does anybody else know? I'd have to look it up. I mean, I can guess based upon the root, but I, I don't want to get it wrong. Let me look it up. Yeah, good question. Um, but that's where the synagogue system came from. That's where Aramaic came from. Okay. Now, Jesus and later Paul went and taught at the synagogues. They wouldn't have existed if it hadn't been for the Babylonian exile. Everything would have been centered under the priesthood at the temple in Jerusalem had it not been for them having gone through this very traumatic event, the Babylonian exile. Okay? Questions about that? Yes, Michael. I just found out synagogue means assembly. Assembly, okay. That makes sense. Well, and, and they, they still follow um, rules. The Jewish people still follow rules that were established during this time period. Um, for instance, they have to have, um, in order to have prayer, they need ten adult Jewish 
males. Uh, it's called a minion. Um, that's bar mitzvah when a boy is 13 and he goes through the rite of passage to be, he becomes an adult. One of, that, one of the things it means is he then is eligible, eligible to be one of the 10 men in a minion. Uh, I went to Israel many, many, many years ago. I'm on an El Al Airlines, which is quite the experience, at least it was back then. We start coming down toward Israel. This was in the late 70s, so this was only you know less than 15 years after the independence. We're coming down, they're playing the theme from Exodus over the loudspeakers of the plane, and there are people in the aisles doing this. Well, along the way, several times on the flight from New York to, to Israel, they, the Jewish men, would go around and peck other men on the soul, uh, shoulder and say, would you join us for a minion? They needed to get ten men, and they would gather at the back of the plane, and they would put on the phylacteries, and they would all pray together. But they had to have ten. That sort of the idea of gathering, or you know, the assembly, was all part of what developed in the synagogue system during the Babylonian times. Okay, and I had to keep saying, mm, "Goyim, sorry, you know, uh, Gentile, I can't get help it without." It. Yes. Uh, why ten? It's How just. Was that established? I I don't know of any any guideline for that in the Hebrew Bible or anything, but they said there had to be ten. And again, it may be there were a lot of things they did back then that had to do with you have to get people together. Okay, there have to be a number of people. You can't do it by yourself because they were. I think part of it was a concern that if we do things individually, we lose our sense of being a Jewish community. And so they would say, you have to get people together for things. It's probably why somewhere along the line, one of the rabbis said, no, it has to be ten, so that we make sure we're getting men together to pray and we don't lose what it means to be Jewish. Okay. All right. Um, what's that? Lots of rules. All right, let's keep going. We talked about the Assyrian period and the Babylonian period. Then we get to the Persian period. Interestingly enough, after the Jews were, the southern kingdom of Judah, rather, was defeated by Babylon, it was only about another hundred years before Babylon fell. And this time they fell to the Persian Empire. Um, the Persian Empire lasted pretty much 538 to 333 BC, a little over 200 years. Um, the, the first big event that we recognize in 539 is when Persia conquers Babylon. In fact, if you read in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, there are a number of books in the Bible that have to do, were written during or have to do with the Babylonian exile. The book of Jeremiah, at the end of it, Jeremiah the prophet is prophesying that if you guys in Judah don't straighten up, God is going to judge you. At the very end of the, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, we have the judgment of God through the Babylonians. Then Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations is what it sounds like. It's a lament. It's a grieving and crying out because of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Then you get Daniel. Daniel is the story of several of the young noblemen, uh, the Jewish people, who were taken into exile and lived there. They were, they were smart, they were well educated, they were good looking, and the Babylonian king and his, his officers decided let's make these, these young men especially part of our royal court. And he did. And that's where Daniel comes in. And so you get this... Um, and then you have the stories of Nebuchadnezzar coming to believe, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as Carolyn learned as a, as a child, it's shake a bed, make a bed, to bed we go. Um, and about these were young Jewish men who were part of the exile. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. Well, in the book of Daniel, the Nebuchadnezzar's probably his, it's a little bit confusing. It says his, his he refers to my father, but it's probably his grandson, his king. And he's having a drunken party with his friends and prostitutes and whatnot, and he calls for the sacred implements that have been taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, and they're, they're having a party with him. And the hand of God appears on the wall and writes, you know, Tekel, Tekel, Nini, Parsa, which they can't get anybody translated. Daniel comes in and translates it and says, it says, you have been weighed in the balance and have been found wanting, and your kingdom's at an end. That night, the Persians conquered Babylon. So, the Persians under King Cyrus defeated Babylon. This is only about 100 years, as I said, after the Babylonians had taken over the southern kingdom of Judah. This is in 539. That same year it started, and really the next year, King Cyrus allowed the Jews, gave them permission to go back to Jerusalem, to go back to Israel or Palestine. 
Cyrus was a smart guy, whereas the Assyrians and the Babylonians, before them, the Hittites and the Egyptians, when they conquered people, they did everything they could to squash them, spread them out, don't let them rise back up. Cyrus took a completely opposite approach. All of the conquered peoples of the Persian Empire, and the Persian Empire became probably the largest empire up to that day. It got exceeded somewhat by Alexander later. But Cyrus said, you know what, Jews? If you'll just sort of join with me and help me make the empire great, I'll let you be Jews. I'll let you go home. I'll let you do whatever you want. And they did that with all of the conquered peoples that the Persian. And so they ended up making friends of these conquered people instead of doing everything they could to oppress them. Very different strategy. And it worked. The Persians, you know, until Alexander the Great came along, the Persians were the dominant force. So um, the King Cyrus allows 42,000 Jews under Zerubbabel, who he appoints governor, and Joshua, who he names as the who allows to be named as the high priest allows them to go back to Jerusalem, they begin to rebuild the temple. Well, they get kind of lax about it. They're not, you know, they're not, they get parked down and then stop and get busy with other stuff. And then you get things like the prophet Haggai comes along and says, you guys better get back to it, you know, rebuild the temple. Then that was in uh, 538, and you get dribbles of Jews going back to Israel, but many of them had made lives. They've been a hundred years. They were two and a half, three generations in Babylon. Many of them, that's, that was what they knew as home. So a lot of them didn't go back. But they kept trickling back. And then in the 450s circa, um, we have Ezra, who goes back to Jerusalem and takes some other returnees with him. And he goes back specifically to teach the people the law of God, the law of Moses, Torah. Okay, the first five books of Moses are called the Torah, or the law. Uh, the first five books we have in our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that's the primary basis of the Jewish faith. The prophets are important, the writings are important, but it's the Torah that is the, the backbone of the Jewish faith. Ezra goes back, he teaches the Torah, he teaches love for the Torah, he teaches people how to live under the Torah. He was the high priest, if you will, at that time. Then, a short time after that, Nehemiah, and you get these, these stories in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. In the Jewish Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. It's called Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay. We break it up in two books. But Nehemiah, then, his brother and some others come back to, uh, to uh, Susa in, in Persia, the capital city where he was working. He was an official uh, under the emperor. And they say, oh, you know, yeah, people are back there and they're trying and everything, but we keep getting these bandits and everybody coming in because there's no wall around Jerusalem anymore. And so anybody who wants to can just come in and stop the work and steal stuff and... So Nehemiah gets convicted by the Spirit of God to go back to Jerusalem and build the wall. Whereas Zerubbabel and Joshua, uh, Haggai emphasized it. They, re they did rebuild the temple, but in the, the latter part of the 5th century BC, that is the early 400s, Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem and leads the effort in very short order. It's a wonderful <coughs> study of organization when you read in the book of Nehemiah how he went about. He, he took groups of people and assigned them sections, and they all worked at one time to get it all done. And so they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, and at the same time period, by the way, is the last of the Old Testament prophets. This is where the Old Testament, the written Old Testament, ends. In about 430 B.C. is Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament. From 430 up until the New Testament times, up until the time of Jesus and the early records of him, is what we call the intertestamental period. It was a period of about 400 years, um, almost 500 years, in which there was no written witness coming from God. There were no prophets of God after Malachi in terms of appointed. The last Old Testament prophet, you could say, was John the Baptist, because John the Baptist was very much in the style and form of many of the Old Testament prophets. Okay? But between Malachi and John the Baptist, there weren't any. And so the Jews, to a great extent, felt like God sort of left us on our own. Okay, we've got to deal with this stuff. Um, then, one of the most significant things, other than perhaps the Babylonian captivity that comes along. Uh, oh, I should, should show you this. This gives you an idea. Do you see what we've got here? This, uh, this is Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. This is what we know of as Greece. It would have been Macedonia and Thrace. This is the Levant, Israel, here. This is Egypt. 
Over here, this area would be the Mesopotamia, um, in Iraq, Iran, etc. So you've got the Medes and the Persians and the Babylonians. Um, and Babylon was in charge. The Medes, Medes and Persians is sort of one word. I mean, it was the Persian Empire, but the Medes were a people that were joined with them. And you get the Persians start taking over everything. And as I said, the Persian Empire was one of the largest ones until, well, not long after them, Alexander the Great comes along. So this was the Persian movement in this eastern Mediterranean, which really is the center of civilization and great empires uh, in the world. So, and, and they even jumped over and attacked Greece any number of times. Persia was Greece's you know, hated enemy because they actually destroyed Athens. Uh, in the Golden Age uh, and a lot of other things, uh, if you can say that. By the way, in October this year, I'm going to be leading a, a, a cruise. <laughs> and I'm not saying this because we get anything out of it. You know, they're, they're, I don't need to recruit people. But uh, they actually only have one leg now. They're going only from Athens to Alexandria. In October, it's an 11-day cruise. We'll stop in Patmos, where John wrote the Revelation. In Ephesus, where John the Apostle was and where Paul set up a church. We'll stop on Crete, on Rhodes visit some of the Crusader uh, locations. We'll stop in Antalya in Turkey, two locations for like four days in the Holy Land, and then end up in Alexandria. If you guys wanna go, it's on Windstar Cruises. You can look it up, windstar.com. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be dealing with all this stuff, all right? Um, so, uh, they do. They only do one leg now. They canceled the second leg from Alexandria. And the reason is they said they think people just don't, you know, there's no easy way to get in, into Alexandria, and then through Cairo, and not a lot of flights. But so, but the still first leg from Athens to Alexandria is, is on. Okay, let's talk about the next period of time, which is the Hellenistic or Greek period. It's called Hellenistic because the original name for the land of Greece was Hellas. So Hellenistic. Particularly, now, Greece had had a golden age under Pericles and all those guys, which is back when the Persians had invaded and destroyed Athens, and, you know, you have the Trojan Wars were earlier than that. You get all this other Greek stuff. None of that really affected what we're talking about, which is Israel and the Jewish people. Until in the 300s, that is the 4th century BC, we get the dude comes along, and he is Alexander the Great. His name was Alexander III. Um, he was born in Pella in Macedonia. Macedonia is the sort of northern area of, uh, not down the mainland of Greece, but he was born to Philip II, who was king of Macedonia. Greece was broken up into several different uh, countries back then. And Philip II is probably the most underappreciated um, ancient figure in history. He was brilliant. He invented a whole new form of warfare, which his son then inherited. He, it used to be that the way they fought wars is you'd get as many men as you could lined up side by side. You'd all draw your swords and scream and rush at the other guys who were all lined up side by side. There was no hardly any organization at all. Philip created the idea of a phalanx, which is a group of men 16 by 16 with long spears. He pretty much invented the idea of heavy cavalry. He invented the idea of having a supply train to go along with you so you knew everybody had enough to eat and ammunition, or, you know, whatever, swords and whatnot. Um, all of these things that Philip II of Macedon created, he formed the most efficient and effective army in the ancient world. Uh, and not even very big. He conquered all of what we know as modern Greece, which was a number of kingdoms, and then put down a bunch of rebellions. But what he really wanted to do was to get back at the Persians who had been invading and conquering and destroying parts of Greece for centuries. So he sets all of this up. His son, Philip, or I'm sorry, his son, uh, Alexander, because he conquered the rest of Greece, Philip convinces Aristotle, yes, that Aristotle, to be his son's tutor. And Aristotle teaches Alexander you know, this is the, the philosopher Alexander, uh, Aristotle, like one of the top three philosophers of ancient times. He taught him not only science and philosophy and rhetoric and all the other skills associated with a philosopher, but he also taught him military training. Aristotle had the whole kit and caboodle. And uh, he trained him until age 16. Immediately after that, Alexander started commanding soldiers under in his father's army. 
By the time he was 18, he was a general with large portions of his father's army while they conquered all of Greece, all of the area that was um, west of Asia Minor, which is what we call modern day Turkey. Asia Minor was sort of the crossroads between, oh, it is the crossroads between Europe and Asia. So, then, to his great misfortune, in 336 BC, Philip is assassinated by his personal bodyguard, one of his personal bodyguards. They believe his wife put him up to it, or his former wife, because he threw his wife over for this prettier younger girl. That's never happened before. <laughs> and one of the reasons they think that she may have had him killed is because this prettier younger girl had a daughter, and they were, they were Alexander and his mother were afraid that if this daughter of the new wife had a son, he might vie for the right of uh, heredity from Alexander. So they get rid of, and once they had actually, once Philip had been assassinated, that Olivia, Alexander's mother, arranged to burn the other wife and her daughter alive. <laughs> they had a very direct approach back in those days. Uh, so anyway, at age 20, Alexander takes over as king of Macedon and therefore ruler of all of what was then Greece. He, because he had already been successful as a general, the generals of uh, Philip's army accept him as their ruler and as the guy in charge. And so all this time, Philip had been planning to cross over into Asia Minor, which is the area that was controlled by, um, part of the furthest west area that was controlled by Persia, to conquer the Persians, to take back Asia Minor, or to take Asia Minor, to, to, and just to keep going, to try to defeat the whole Persian Empire. Well, Alexander, at age 20, takes over. Two years later, he gets all his, all his stuff together. He crosses over into Asia Minor and launches a campaign against the Persians that had been planned by his father. His father set all this up. That's why I say Philip II of Macedon is, is not appreciated like he should be. Between 334 and 323, Alexander and his armies conquer pretty much the whole known world. Um, became the largest empire ever, and it's and they could he couldn't be stopped. Alexander never lost a battle, even though his army was a little over thirty thousand men. The first army of the Persians he fought was a hundred thousand men. Wow. Later on, Darius, the king of the Persians, who retreated when he got was getting beat, um, later on put together a two hundred thousand person army. Alexander beat them with 38,000 men, okay? Uh, they still study Alexander's tactics in military schools. He was the greatest single conqueror ever, right? Uh, he puts Napoleon and others to shame. Um, and it, fascinating stories about him. For instance, it took, you can imagine how many ships it took for him to cross the Bosphorus, to cross over into Asia Minor from Greece, from Macedon. And they say that as his, as his ship was just pulling up to shore, Alexander threw a spear into the land of Asia Minor, and he, he called out so all of his men could hear that he claimed Asia Minor as a gift from the gods. Actually, he claimed all of Asia as a gift from the gods. He landed, defeats with 38,000 men, a 100,000 person army, and he just keeps going, and nobody can beat him. He takes over all, in fact, um, Alexander the Great. Okay, he crosses over, takes over all of Asia Minor, comes down through the Levant, through Palestine, and along the way, he's defeating armies right and left. He gets down to the city of Tyre. You've heard of Tyre and Sidon, okay? One of the Phoenician cities. There was a city of Tyre, a town of Tyre, on the coast, but the fortress of Tyre, the important part, was on a little island that was a kilometer out from the shore. No way to get to it except by boat. Well, he didn't have any boats. So he tears down the part of Tyre that was on the land, takes all the rubble and builds a causeway a kilometer long to get out to the city of Tyre. And then he realizes, you know, we probably do need ships too. So he goes and gets a navy. <laughs> the Persians who he had already defeated by that point still had ships. They were putting into ports that were now controlled by him. So he just took all the ships. He attacks Sire, uh, Tyre, defeats it. Now if cities gave in to him, he was usually pretty nice about it. If they didn't, he executed 30,000 people in Tyre and sold all of the rest of them off into slavery. Um, he could be pretty rough. He continued on down. The interesting thing was he gets down into Palestine, and before he can attack Jerusalem, the high priest of Jerusalem at that time goes out and takes some of the high priests. They parade out. They make gifts to Alexander, and they show him 
the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible books that prophesy that from the land of Greece will come one who will destroy the Persians, from Daniel, basically. They say, here's what these, these symbols mean. Well, Alexander thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> so he said, I like you guys, and I like your book. <laughs> so as long as you don't regard it, it's me, I'll let you leave you alone. So he didn't attack Jerusalem. He didn't bother them. He went on down to and conquered Egypt and planted the city of Alexandria in Egypt. In fact, um, he Alexander was the George Foreman of his day. He had he founded ten cities, at least ten cities, and named them all guess. Alexandria. Alexandria. You know about George Foreman. He's got like how many sons? Six or seven? Nine? They're all called George. Name them all George. So Alexander, once he conquered all of Egypt, in Egypt he is declared to be a god. He then heads back up, goes up, conquers Babylon, heads east. Uh, continues, he defeats all of the, the armies of the ancient Assyrians and everybody else, goes all the way over into India, wow. discovers that war elephants are kind of cool, <laughs> defeats King Porus, who was king uh, of the Indian peoples, and he wants to keep going. I mean, after, after almost eight years of campaign and battle, Alexander had the, the goal. He wanted to go all the way to the Great Sea, it was called, meaning all the way to the Pacific. He conquered Afghanistan, which is a country that almost nobody else has ever been able to conquer. Ask the Russians, ask the British, ask us. Um, and yet he did. And he, he wanted to go all the way to the sea. And his, his generals finally said, Al, 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 how long are we going to do this? we got to go home sometime. I think this is enough. So finally, his soldiers convince him, after 11,000 miles of marching and campaign, <laughs> to go home. So he agrees, and I think if he had agreed, he, he feared that he would have a mutiny, as much as I loved him and respected him. So he heads back. He gets back as far as Babylon, which he wants to make his sort of capital of his whole empire. He falls sick and dies at the age of 32. Okay. Well, somebody said, you know, when Alexander was my age, he'd been dead for 20 years. <laughs> um, there, and there's some other wonderful stories. For instance, when Alexander came over into Asia Minor, and he was confronting with 38,000 men, an army of 100,000 under Darius, Darius sent and said, we don't need to fight. I will give you all of Asia Minor. You can just have it, and we'll pay tribute to you. One of... And Alexander said no. One of Alexander's soldiers, Parmenion, who was a great general, Parmenion said, if I were Alexander, I think I would have taken that deal. And Alexander looked at him and said, if I were Parmenion, I would too. <laughs> he saw himself as divine. He, many claimed that he had been a son of Zeus, and I think that Alexander started believing that. He was declared to be a god uh, in, when he was in Egypt, as I said. So, he conquered almost the whole known world, was never defeated, died at age 32-33, right in there, created one of the largest empires ever, but when he died, and this is him on his deathbed, he left no heir. Biggest empire in the world, nobody to inherit it. In fact, when he was on his deathbed, his generals were saying, who, who is now the emperor? Who's going to be in charge? And all he said was, to the strongest. Well, that's a recipe for war if there ever was one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So after his death, for all that he did, we have what's called the War of the Diadochi. Di 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 we don't know. They don't know if it's food poisoning or appendicitis. We don't, we don't have details on that. Some people think he might have been poisoned. But for the most part, his soldiers, the people around him, loved it. There were some who complained that he was... He went native, you know, that he was too quick to pick up cultural styles and stuff, which is an interesting thing to say because in all of his travels, one of the things that Alexander did, and the most important part, not just conquering, he spread Greek language and Greek culture and Greek arts and everything else everywhere he went. In fact, this is why the whole world became Hellenized, pretty much the whole new world. Greek became the common formal language. Again, the Jews spoke, Hebrew was their 
their original language. They spoke Aramaic because of the Babylonian exile in the streets. But Greek was what you spoke if you were in a business meeting. Or if you're doing anything more formal, like if you're writing a book of the New Testament. You wrote it in Greek. Because of the influence of Alexander. The, the Jews at that time, one of their big concerns was that the Greek culture was becoming so dominant and so many Jews were being Hellenized, meaning turned into Greek speakers. And they were dressing like Greeks. They were going to these wrestling matches where men wrestled naked. <gasps> For a Jew, that was pretty horrendous. They were going to Greek theater, which was not consistent with... And so you began to develop these parties of very pious Jews whose primary goal in life was to oppose the Hellenizing, to oppose the effort to become more Greek-like amongst the Jews. They were called the Hasidim. Hasidim were the pious ones. They were the originators of the Pharisees, who were so keen not to let anything pollute the Jewish faith, not to do anything that would be contrary to the Law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. The reason they were so head up about this is because they went through a period of time where the Jewish people almost did get assimilated, not to the Babylonians, which is what they'd been afraid of at first, but to the Greek culture, speaking Greek, etc. I'm going to touch on this in a minute. It got so bad that by the 3rd century, the 200s BC, a lot of Jews didn't know how to speak Hebrew anymore. They only knew how to speak Greek or Aramaic. And because of that, they couldn't read their own Bible. Yes? So in that transition were the Persians as religious as the Babylonians and the Greeks afterwards? Well, the Persians had their own religion, but they didn't try to force it on other people. I mean, they had their own gods that they worshipped, uh, but they were not, um, you know, they were not trying to enforce that like, you know, like some of the other ancient peoples had been. Okay, uh, and the Greeks under under Alexander, while he took things by force, he didn't do as much to try to force people to be Greek-like, to speak Greek and everything. It's just because that was so much the dominant. I mean, you know, you couldn't go anywhere that wasn't now controlled by Greece or by you know the Alexander and his armies that um, they thought it was pretty cool. You know, Greek's a pretty good language. The Greek culture was kind of cool. And so it wasn't so much they were forced into it as that they began to just adopt it because it was the dominant culture and it, it was a good one in terms of arts and culture and education and language and all of that. Um, the Jews were not as quick to pick up on the Greek gods, but there was always a fear by the Hasidim, at least the pious ones, that they might do that. Okay, so after Alexander, there is a battle between his generals to see who is going to rule. Um, it's called the War of the Diadochi. Diadochi means the, um, the uh, sur is it survivor or, okay, let me check my notes. Let me be survivor. Successors. I knew that wasn't the right word. The War of the Successors, Alexander's generals. After three years of war, four of them ended up kind of on top. They were Ptolemy, who took control of all of Egypt, which was a real jewel because Egypt had such a long, rich history and culture and they had agriculture and everything. Seleucus, who took over Syria and Mesopotamia, all of the area north of Israel and uh, west and Asia Minor as well, most of Asia Minor. Uh, the biggest area, Seleucid, uh, had uh, control. <coughs> then two others, Cassander and Lysimachus, took over part of Greece and part of Macedonia. But they were not as significant. The two most important ones, the two most powerful ones, were Ptolemy I. He was called Ptolemy I Soter, Soter he called himself, which means savior. These guys thought pretty well of themselves. Um, and he took over all of Egypt, and that included Palestine. He gave the Jewish people a lot of freedom. Ptolemy did, and his, his descendants, who were still in charge, did. He basically left them alone. He thought, okay, they're not giving me any trouble, I'll leave them alone. And they did well under the Ptolemies from Egypt. But it was during that time, because they were being treated pretty well, that's when they especially started taking in the, uh, the Greek clothing styles, their artistic tastes, the social and athletic events, and that's when Greek really started taking over, so much so that it was... Um, and, and because Ptolemy controlled Palestine, was in Egypt, the capital of Egypt at that time was <coughs> Alexandria. And it was the center of learning. And because Alexander had liked the Jews and they were well educated and he thought they were pretty cool, he had had Jewish scholars come to Alexandria. <coughs> Alexandria, at, at various times in its history, has been as much as one-third Jewish. 
huge flow of people. And how many times in the Bible do you hear, oh, we got problems, let's go to Egypt. Okay? <laughs> it happened with the Holy Family. It happened with uh, uh, Joseph was taken into Egypt. Jacob and all of his family go to Egypt. You know, uh, Egypt had been a, a strong relationship between the land of Egypt and the Jews all down through their history. Well, in Alexandria in the third century, that was where Jewish scholars said, we've got to do something about the fact that our people, the Jewish people, can no longer read their own Hebrew Bible. So they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek and finished it about 250 BC. It's called the Septuagint. It's called the Septuagint. Septuagint means 70, because it's said that 70 or 72 scholars wrote or translated the Hebrew Bible into the Septuagint, uh, Greek Septuagint. So that Greek speaking or Hellenized Jews could now read their own Bible again because they've forgotten how to read Hebrew. Okay? <coughs> then Ptolemy, under Ptolemy, the Jews did really well, but then we have the Seleucid period. Remember, Ptolemy the first Sotera was one of the strong generals that came out on top at Egypt. The, the second strongest general at that point was the Seleucus or the Seleucid Empire. He called himself Seleucus the first Nicantor. Nicantor means conqueror. Again, these guys like themselves. Um, in 198, the, the descendant of Seleucid I decided that they were strong enough and they actually attacked Ptolemy, the Ptolemies, and they took over Palestine. So they took <coughs> Palestine away from Ptolemaic Egypt at the Battle of Caesarea Philippi, and so they're running them now. In 190, the Seleucid Empire starts having trouble because the Romans are growing in power. And they attack Asia Minor, which was controlled by the Seleucid Empire. And at the Battle of Magnesia, they take over control of all of Asia Minor. And in that one battle, it shows you something about the Romans, who had learned something from Philip and Alexander, by the way, the idea of the phalanx, you know, the controlled body of men attacking, not just a mass. The Romans at the Battle of Magnesia in 190 BC, when they defeated the Seleucids, the Seleucid Emperor, Seleucid Antiochus III, lost 53,000 men in that one battle. Rome lost 400. Wow. So the Seleucids said, okay, you can have Asia Minor. <laughs> okay, we'll go back to Babylon and to our place. Well, that didn't sit very well, but the Romans were beginning to ascend in power, and they were showing up in different places. In 175 BC, a new ruler takes over the Seleucid Empire called Antiochus IV. Later on, he changes his name to be Antiochus IV Epiphanes. What was yesterday? <laughs> the day of Epiphany. What does Epiphany mean? A manifestation from God. So this was Antiochus IV manifested from God. And he thinks that he is God's answer to everything that's needed in the world. And first he starts taking tighter control of, Jer of Jerusalem and Israel, or Palestine. He starts paying bribes to put people in key positions that he wants, including even the high priest. And so the Jews start feeling as though this Seleucid emperor is compromising their religious belief, their faith system. And they don't like it, but they can't do anything yet. Then in 168 BC, Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, gets really too big for his britches, and he decides that it's time for him to go back down and finish, finish off the Ptolemies and take over all of Egypt, which they still control. He's already taken Palestine from him. He's going to take all of Egypt. He goes down there, and when he gets to Egypt, he bumps into his old roommate, because he had grown up in Rome. He had learned from the Romans. His old roommate was now an envoy of the Roman Senate and the Roman military. And so Antiochus says, what are you doing here? I'm going to take over this whole country. And he says, I don't think so. I think you need to calm down and go back where you came from. And Antiochus says, you can't tell me that. He said, well, I need to report back to the Roman Senate. And his old roommate, literally, they had been roommates in Rome. His old roommate, envoy from Rome took his sword out and drew a circle around Antiochus IV Epiphanes and said, before you step outside this circle, I need you to tell me what you want me to tell Rome. <laughs> Which means, you decide right now, do you go home or do you become an enemy of Rome? Right now. Before you step one more foot, Antiochus went home. <laughs> Because Rome had already proven. In fact, his fear his whole life, 
after that was that Rome was going to land on the eastern shore of, of the Mediterranean and take over his empire. Well, he goes back home. While he's down there, word of his defeat comes back to Jerusalem. And in fact, the rumor was he'd been killed by the Romans, but they knew he'd been defeated. So they start a rebellion. Leave it to the Jews. They get just a little hint. They start having a rebellion. <laughs> they start to rebel, and Titus comes back. He crucifies like 8,000 of them, and he clamps down on the Jewish people in a way more than ever before. For instance, okay, this is, here's a map. Up there you'll see uh, Cassander and Lysimachus, two of the lesser generals of the four that made it. Seleucus controlled all of this area, Asia Minor, uh, all of Mesopotamia, which is here, and, the, you know, pretty much all of this area. Ptolemy controlled Egypt and this section, which was the Levant, or would have been Israel. And then later, Seleucus, the Seleucid Empire, comes down, they conquer the Levant, and they go down to try to take over all of Ptolemaic Egypt, right? Um, now, once Seleucus decides, of the Seleucid Empire, it's Antiochus IV, decides that these Jews, I'm tired of this, and he, it's sort of like, you know, he's stung. He got the Romans, kicked him back home, and so he's going to take it out on the cat, which happens to be the Jewish people. Um, and so he starts oppressing the Jews. For instance, he says they can no longer assemble for prayer because he wants to say, you can't be Jews anymore. You have to be completely Greek. No more of this just passive, you know, Hellenizing. Um, they were forbidden to observe the Sabbath. They were uh, forbidden to own any Hebrew scriptures, the Bible. The circumcision was illegal. Women were killed for circumcising their son, having their son circumcised. Dietary laws were illegal. They forced Jews to eat pork. They set up um, temple. They set up altars and statues to Zeus and other Greek gods in the temple. And for three years, they sacrificed pigs on altars to Greek gods in the temple in Jerusalem. This did not go over well with the Jews. And so, and I'm just going to run all these up here because I want to finish out in the next five minutes. Oops. What happens is in 167, the Jews have had enough. In a, in a, it's the whole revolt, which was so just right under the surface brewing. It was set off when a group of Greek soldiers went to a town called, um, called Modain, which is not too far from Jerusalem, and they ordered a local priest named Mattathias to sacrifice a pig to a Greek god. Mattathias refused. Well, when the Greek soldiers threatened the town because of this, another Jew steps forward and says, well, I'll do it if Mattathias won't. Mattathias draws his sword, kills this guy, and then he kills the Greek soldiers. He and his five sons flee into the hills and start what's called the Maccabean Revolt. Not too long after that, Mattathias is killed. But one of his sons, not the oldest one, but one of his sons, Judas, proves himself to be a great military leader. In fact, they are kind of kicking buns on the Seleucid army by ambush and guerrilla warfare and all that kind of stuff. In fact, Judas gets the nickname Judas Maccabeus. Maccabeus means the hammer. Judas the hammer. And so it becomes known as the Maccabean Rebellion and the Maccabean period. Well, that continues for a number of years, guerrilla warfare, you know, hit and run, and the Seleucids just simply can't, can't seem to get anything right here. So that uh, in 164, three years after this, the whole rebellion started, Judas and his soldiers, Judas Maccabeus and his soldiers, managed to retake the temple in Jerusalem. You know, they, they take over part of Jerusalem, not all of it first, and they cleanse the temple from these pagan altars and pagan sacrifice and, and the, the Greek statues. They cleansed the temple during an eight-day period, which became the basis for the celebration of Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights. Part of the cleansing of the temple, there was a miracle that they, were, they, they lit um, lamps, and they didn't have enough oil for more than one day. And so they simply prayed, you know, Lord, bless us with this. And the, lo the oil lasted for eight days while they finished cleansing the temple and praying and preparing. And that's why there's the eight-day festival of lights of Hanukkah. Okay, that's what Hanukkah is a celebration of. Well, Judas and his soldiers then conquer the rest of the city. And then Judas is killed. His brother Jonathan takes over. Jonathan arranges a treaty with the Romans for the Romans to force the Seleucids out of Jerusalem, out of Palestine. They force them up into Antioch up north. 
uh, into Syria. And later on, the Romans defeat them. And in 25 years from this time, the Romans completely annihilate the whole Seleucid Empire. It doesn't exist anymore. <coughs> Once they had gotten rid of the Seleucids, the descendants of Mattathias, first his other sons and then their descendants, formed the Hasmonean dynasty, starting in 141 through 63 BC. So it's about 80 years. The Hasmonean dynasty is the first time since the 500, since 586, when the Babylonians defeated them, the first time in all that time, over 400 years, that 445 years, that the Jews have self self determining they're not under somebody else's power anymore. So the descendants of Mattathias, starting with Simon, one of his sons that Jonathan's been killed, Judas had been killed earlier. Simon is named high priest and leader over the Jews. His descendants become kings. They rule not particularly well sometimes. They were pretty ruthless, especially with the non-Jewish cities that were under their control. The, the Gentile cities of the north, which were called the Decapolis later. Um, and during that time period, the biggest problem they had was internal struggle. Because you still had at least three very distinct groups. You had the Hellenized Jews, the ones who had bought into the Greek culture and wanted to speak Greek and wanted to have Greek theater and wear Greek clothes, cool togas and stuff. And then you had the Hasidim, the pious ones, who thought that was from you know, the pit of hell, who wanted to fight against that. And then you had in the middle the Hasmonean rulers, the people who were in charge, who were trying to keep a balance. Well, those struggles got worse and worse. And the whole time it was happening, the, they were having struggles. They were taking over more parts of the land until they ended up being about the same size as they had been under Solomon in their heyday. But the greatest problems, again, continue to be between the Hasidim, the pious ones, the really conservative Jews, who later became the Pharisees, and the Hellenized Jews, the Greek Jews, who later became the Sadducees. So this fight between the Hellenized Jews and the really pious, conservative, strict Hebrew Jews later on became the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And that's the basis of them fighting each other, not getting along, and doctrinal differences and all kinds of other things. Well, the Hasmonean rulers are trying to keep everything together during this time, and sometimes they're pretty ruthless. In fact, in, in uh, one of the kings, Alexander Janaeus, in about 100 BC, crucified 800 Pharisees at one time in order to stop what he thought was going to be a rebellion. As they went along, Rome is continuing to grow. We're almost done here. Two more minutes. And in 63 BC, Rome has plans for taking over all of that part of the world and Egypt. So Rome sends the great general Pompey in 63 BC. He comes in. They had defeated the Hasmonean Empire. They start marching down through the Levant into Palestine. They're freeing Gentile cities that the Jews had ruthlessly controlled that later became known as the Decapolis. You'll read that in the Bible, in Acts. In fact, Jesus goes to some of the cities of the Decapolis. Remember the man with the demons, the, the, the Gadarene? Well, Gadara was one of the Decapolis cities. That was a Gentile location. You remember how the demons came out and they went into a herd of pigs and ran off into the water? Well, the Jews wouldn't have had a herd of pigs. They were unclean. That was a Gentile region. Those were the areas that Pompey first freed. They lined up with him, and some of them joined his army. He comes down, and he's preparing to... Uh, Jerusalem can't decide what to do. They decide they're going to fight back. And Pompey attacks the city very efficiently. He kills 12,000 Jewish citizens in one day. He walks into the holy place of the temple to look around. I mean, other than the fact that he was a ruthless general, which that's what the Romans did, he actually wasn't that oppressive to people. He just fought the battle. When he won, he appointed new high priests. He beheaded any of the rulers that wouldn't do what he wanted. Um, and over the next two decades, Jerusalem then is controlled by Romans, mostly by governors. Governors whose names are things like Pontius Pilate. A governor appointed from Rome, reporting to Rome, to control this area that Pompey had, had conquered. Uh, you get names like Festus and Felix that are in the book of Acts as well. Then, uh, one of the things that Pompey did was he got help from various local people who knew the lay of the land, who knew the politics, who knew the players. One of the ones that helped him the most was a man named Antipater. Antipater was an Idumean. Idumea was the southern, like down in Arabia. 
It was the land of the Edomites. You will remember Jacob and Esau. Jacob's 12 sons formed the, the nation of Israel. Esau, his older brother by a couple of minutes, was the father of the Edomite people, who later were called the Idumeans. They were not Jews. They were Semitic. They were descended in the same, as far down as Jacob, but they were not Jews. Um, Antipater married an Arabic woman who wasn't Jewish. They had several sons. And so their various sons were given responsibility because Antipater was a help to Pompey. Pompey liked him. He let his sons take over areas of responsibility. Eventually, I'm going to do the short version of this. Eventually, when the Parthians, which are the Persians, came back as a new empire called the Parthians, they invade the Romans. Uh, they kill one of, Herod, uh, one of Antipater's sons. The other one is named Herod. Herod, who's a favorite of the Romans now, he flees through Egypt back to Rome, spends some time in Rome. In Rome, they declare that he is the king of the Jews, mostly because they want somebody who will lead the fight back to take the land from the Parthians again. Herod comes back with Roman armies supporting him. He takes over and conquers the Parthians, takes over Israel again, Palestine, takes over Jerusalem. And between the years of 37 and 4 BC, Herod, who was not a Jew, Sounds like a song by Abinad. <laughs> so, not a Jew. Um, he, he rules it with an iron hand. I preached about him yesterday. And rules until the time he is the ruler during the time of Jesus. It is Herod who is there as ruler when Jesus is born. It is Herod who kills the innocent uh, male babies in, in and around Bethlehem to try to kill this Messiah that he heard about. And Herod did a lot of things like rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, but he mostly did it to try to, model, to, to tell, let the people in Rome, his bosses, know, I'm doing a good job running things here. But he was hated. He was terribly hated and despised by the Jews. And I told the story yesterday that uh, when he knew he was going to die, he went to Jericho where he had one of his fancy palaces, and he had all the, the um, Jewish noble families ordered them to come to him. He put them in the Hippodrome, locked them up in the Hippodrome, told his soldiers that when he died, kill all of them so that I can be sure that they will mourn in the land of Israel when I die. He killed his father-in-law. He killed several of his ten wives. He killed two of his own sons. Um, not a good guy. But he was the one who was in charge during the time Jesus was born. Um, I'm going to stop there. I can give you a little bit more detail about some of the other heirs of Herod as we get into some of the, some of the particulars. Joanne. Um, explain how Esau was, Esau was Semitic, but not Jew. Right? Semitic means descended from Shem, one of the sons of um, Noah. So one of the sons of, from, from Shem, we end up, Abraham was from the line of Shem. So everybody from Abraham is Semitic. Abraham's son was Isaac. Isaac's sons were Jacob and Esau. So both Jacob and Esau were Semitic, but not Jewish. Jewish then is the line from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the 12 sons of Jacob, which were the 12 tribes, and everybody descended from that. So there were other peoples, the Edomites, the Ammonites, other people in the Palestine area that were Semitic. They were descended from Shem, the son of Noah, but they were not descended from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Jacob, which, which was required for being Jewish. So they were cousins, distant cousins, but it's not the same thing as being Jewish. Other questions? Did I tell you you were going to get a belly full of history or what? <laughs> Is this interesting to you? Yes. Okay.